Samir, earlier this year, you stated that we were in an age of disruption. We're almost a year later. Would you say that, we're, would you say that we are still, still there? I mean, do you think societies can find a way to navigate the technological disruption of the fourth industrial revolution? The technology, the societies are struggling. I think the technology, the rapidity of change, the, the, the breadth of change, the depth of change is uh, making all of us struggle to keep up. Uh, I think there are three big baskets that are fundamentally changing even as we speak. The first is, uh, of course, uh, the politics. Yeah. Technology is reorganizing politics completely. Uh, it is producing new leaders, it is mobilizing communities, it is uh, changing the way governments control citizens, it is uh, adding a new paradigm to external interference. The politics that we knew no longer exists. The second big basket, of course, is around the economics. Uh, how you work, how you consume, how you trade, how you sell, uh, how you love. Uh, you know, the, there's a whole economic arrangement that has surfaced, which is remarkably different. Finally, societies. I think uh, tribalism is back. Nativism is back. We have hashtags which are camouflaging this true, deep, human, guttural instinct. And I'm seeing technology bring it all out uh, into the fore. So I think all three big baskets have dramatically uh, transformed or are in the process of transforming, uh, and we're struggling. How do you see America First and the China Dream coexist? Or not? As far as I'm concerned, I think we are going to see a multiplicity of Cold Wars of the 20th century play out in the 21st. I think you're going to have a, a, a tech war or a tech trade war between the Chinese and the Americans. In 15 years' time, you're going to see a similar friction between the Indians and the Chinese. Mm -hmm. You're going to see some other geographies emerge in Africa. The Nigerians and others will come up with their own game. You're going to see a plethora of uh, these uh, contests play out in the 21st century. Uh, I think uh, the US and China, uh, and I can uh, uh, argue that in the last one year, we have seen something happen which is dramatically different. I think for the first time, we are seeing in the US, uh, the main street, the people, uh, the deep state, uh, the intelligence agencies, and the, the Congress all align, all agree that we need to change the business as usual with China. On the other hand, you're seeing the Chinese not back down. Yeah. You're seeing the Chinese yeah. uh, standing up, the Chinese countering the uh, American proposition uh, with uh, one of their own. Um, and I, th I, I think this is a very interesting period. You think it's going to be more about friction than coexisting or peaceful co coexistence? Uh, I think coexistence is certainly going to be uh, achieved. Mm -hmm. I do, I'm not sure about the peaceful and frictionless coexistence. Okay. I think it's going to be coexistence for sure. You're going to have your spheres of influence. Mm -hmm. You're going to have your condominiums. You're going to influence people within those condominiums. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the BRI is the Chinese proposition. Yeah. Uh, America has uh, wired the world in the 20th century, so they are the incumbents. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're going to see this happening. With more and more tensions around cyberspace and the digital realm at large, how do we balance the imperative between an open internet and national interests? To me, a secure individual, which means privacy intact, which means expression intact, which means encryption existing, yeah. which means is data absolutely secure, is in, in part going to implicate the national security. Every secure individual within a nation means a very secure nation. When nations create backdoors, when nation creates bad encryption, when nations create bad expression laws, you are allowing others to game you. And I think nations that are mature enough to understand that in this particular realm, unlike where you sent aircraft carriers and, yeah. and big missiles, in this particular realm, uh, the digital uh, space, it is the sophistication of the individual's protection that is going to define national security. So I don't see a dichotomy in the two approaches. A secure individual, a free individual, a safe individual is going to be a safe nation. So I guess the bigger picture question here is, with this democratic ideal of cyberspace having given way to lots of main, many concerns around privacy, mm -hmm. concentration of wealth, and national security, can the internet still realize its democratic promise, do you think? It will struggle to, because like every other medium that promised uh, freedoms and expressions in the past, mm -hmm. you're going to see the incumbents come back and try and control that space. So you're going to see the very old feudal struggle yeah. of controlling resources, control, controlling spaces, controlling directions, mm -hmm. controlling uh, economics. And I think we are seeing that play out. We are seeing big tech, we are seeing big states, we are seeing small states. All of them seek to do exactly this, control spaces. I, I think democracy is under threat. 
it is not necessarily a beneficiary of the technological revolution as it has unfolded in the last 10 years. I think it could be a collateral damage, a victim in fact. What role do you think private technology platforms will play in the governance and security of these digital spaces? They are the ones who are governing the space. The coder in Bangalore, in Silicon Valley, in Qatar, in uh, the GCC countries defines how we read, how we consume, how we produce, how we ride a car, how we uh, manage a taxi service, how we uh, eventually uh, manage our uh, supply chains around shipping, production centers to 3D, um, uh, uh, the genetic coding, etc. So even before you reach the court, the court of law or the parliament or any executive branch of government, technology has already embedded a rule. And that rule is not being written by you and me. It yeah. is being written by big tech. It is being written by investors who are investing in big tech. Yeah. So big tech is increasingly defining how we exist. And this is a reality that we need to begin to internalize so that we could find a way of making big tech more responsible, more accountable, and making big tech and the boardrooms of big tech part of the democratic mandate. Is there a role for multi multilateral, supranational governance of the space? I mean, does the UN have a role still? The question is that can UN reform fast enough to be relevant to the fourth industrial revolution? Or are we going to see, in the absence of that, regional arrangements, bilateral arrangements? Mm -hmm. uh, I think the UN is important. I don't think UN is doing enough to remain relevant. So more your second scenario of more regional agreements. More regional agreements, more bilateral and, and group-based agreements, uh, agreements between companies and countries. Yeah. Well, I think size matters, and con uh, countries are beginning to realize this. The African Union is aggregating to protect sovereignty. Yeah. The European Union is, has already flexed its super sovereign muscles through the GDPR. Uh, big countries like India uh, are going to call the shots simply because of the large number of consumer uh, that they offer. And I think this, this, this rather uh, Darwinian scenario is unfolding. I think might is right is going to be codified in the digital age. You, rec you recently wrote something that I thought was really interesting. You said that artificial intelligence nationalism is a defining global mood. C could you expand on this? Think about this. Who are the folks who are putting in the largest amount of money in predictive technologies? in autonomous technologies, in artificial intelligence. And you will find it is the DOD, the defense departments of yeah. all countries. Yeah. The largest amount of spend, be it uh, uh, smart drones, smart submarines, be it uh, bots on the net, yeah. you will see a plethora of defense departments putting in huge amount of money. Now, this is not universal tech. When you build weapon systems, when you build defense systems, when you build offensive capabilities, it is meant to be insular and, and exclusive. It is meant only for you. I think that human nature of keeping uh, expertise, of keeping the, the leverage to one's own self is going to prevail. And AI is th uh, the space where you're going to see this happen most rapidly. Do you think democracies can prove resilience in the face of polarization and populism? No, I think um, uh, one of the areas we have really struggled with is the information overload we all experience every yeah. day. I think the way we manage information is the single most important question for all governments, all citizens, all companies, and all institutions. Uh, I, don't have an, I don't have a template. Uh, some people believe that censorship might be an option, regulation might be an option. Some suggest self-regulation and technology itself could be an antidote. I think the jury is out. I think that we cannot apply 20th century learnings to this 21st century information age. We will have to come up with a new arrangement of managing data, managing content, managing information flows. Otherwise, democracy is in threat, regimes are in threat, societies are in threat, and of course, individuals are in grave danger. So, management of information, management of content is going to be the single most important 21st century question for global governments, individual governments. Thank you, Samir.